Hello, this is Justin Williams with the Wolfpacker Hoops Talk podcast. I'm joined today, as always, going forward for our Hoops Talk podcast with basketball analyst Brian Geisinger. He's a uh, writer and editor at the ACCSports.com. He's a co-host on Sports Channel 8, the radio show on 99.9 The Fan in Raleigh. He's also a co-host on the BuzzBeat podcast covering the Charlotte Hornets um, podcast. And anyways, uh, he's going to join us uh, to talk NC State basketball. But before we get too far into this episode, following last night's 79-76 to 76 NC State win over North Carolina, this podcast is brought to you in part by JFQ Lending. With interest rates below 3%, there has never been a better time to lock in a low fixed interest rate on your mortgage. You'll never need to think about refinancing again. Set it and forget it. And with JFQ Lending, you are guaranteed to get the highest level of customer service. They have an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and over 3,000 five-star reviews. Give Hunter Clawson a call today at 480-513-3992 or email Hunter directly at hclawson at jfqlending.com. That's H-C-L-A-U-S-S-E-N at jfqlending.com. JFQ Lending, Inc., Equal Access Lender, licensed in over 40 states, www.jfqlending.com. And while you're at it, head over to thewolfpacker.com and use promo code PAC60. That's promo code PAC60 for a free 60-day trial on all of our premium content news and analysis over at the website. We're now starting ACC conference play in men's and women's basketball. And, uh, of course, the bowl game's coming up in early January for football. So plenty of good content up on the site coming up on a daily basis. So be sure to take advantage of that 60-day free trial. That's promo code PAC60 on thewolfpacker.com. Okay, so let's finally talk some hoops, Brian. Um, an exciting night for Wolfpack fans last night. We're recording this on December 23rd. We're probably going to be posting this uh, either on Christmas Eve or Christmas as a little holiday nugget for all of the listeners at home. But uh, Christmas came a little bit early for Wolfpack fans with a 79-76 victory in PNC Arena over number 17, North Carolina. The win marked Kevin Keats's first victory over the Tar Heels at home in his first four seasons in Raleigh. Of course, he beat uh, Carolina, I believe, in his first season when Al Freeman, I think, dropped about 30 points in the Dean Dome, um, but, you know, was never able to get the monkey off his back, if you will, in PNC Arena. So a big win for Keats, a big win for this Wolfpack team to start 1-0 in conference play and advance to 5-1 and on the season before taking a week-long break here as they'll continue ACC play uh, in late December and into early January. Um, but Brian, I'm just curious to know, you know, kind of your instant reaction from last night. Um, I thought that was probably the most fun game we've seen on NC State's schedule so far. I mean, definitely the first, other than St. Louis, the first opponent of relevance, if you will. But you know, I kind of throw out that St. Louis game a little bit because, you know, NC State was playing with such a shorthanded roster and it, we didn't really see a true NC State performance in that game. The pack kind of ran out of gas, but finally last night you saw NC State closer to full strength and you see what, what they were capable of against the top 25 North Carolina team. Uh, yeah, it was a really entertaining game. Uh, high possessions, like almost 80 possessions in that game. I think around 77 official possessions. Uh, so it was up and down. Not the cleanest game in terms of shot making, at least from certainly from UNC's perspective, which certainly uh, <laughs> proved uh, it was, was good for NC State late in the game uh, on that last possession. Uh, but it, and obviously Jericho Helms didn't have his a game, but I just, as far as shooting the basketball goes, but I just thought NC state had a great game plan cooked up. I think they mixed in a couple new, th I've seen most games, <laughs> uh, certainly the last two seasons that Kevin Keats has coached at NC state. I've tracked and logged a lot of these games. I thought state mixed in some new stuff last night or some stuff we haven't seen in a while, at least all of which is just centered on getting, you know, pick and roll with Devin Daniels or, with, with Shaquille Moore, or Cam Hayes. So again, it's not like they're splitting the atom or anything, but a couple of new wrinkles here and there. They even let Manny Bates handle, handle the ball at the elbow one, one possession, which is, I think is sort of interesting uh, going forward. <laughs> and speaking of Bates, I just, he continues to get better and better as a defensive force. Um, he's not perfect on that end. I think he still has strides to go in terms of his, drop pick and roll defense 
he can still get displaced in the air against smaller finishers at the rim. We saw that happen against St. Louis, but five blocks last night. Um, this is his third game this season with five or more blocks, 15% block rate this, this season. Now he's third in the country in block rate, blocking about six shots per 40 minutes. Um, and yeah, about 15% of opponent field goal attempts when he's on the court, Manny Bates is blocking, which like, if you want to know why state's going to have like likely have the best defense it's had before under Kevin Keats. Um, yeah, guys like Thomas Allen and, and Shaquille Moore and Cam Hayes, they certainly help. Yeah, but having Manny Bates back at the rim has been uh, huge for them. And you what's, you saw what happened. I mean, UNC had probably its best stretch of the game last night when Bates sat the final couple minutes, right, of the first half. And you mm-hmm. had Devin Daniels in foul trouble. You had Manny Bates in foul trouble. UNC was making a run uh, after Royal Williams decided to go with that little half-court trap and started blitzing ball screens. I thought State – State man ended up making just enough plays against it, but that gave that gave the pack some trouble, especially once Devin Daniels got knocked out of the game. And you know, if we want, we can sort of like mock at Andrew Playtech for flopping at the, on the charge call to get uh, Devin his um, his second foul pretty early into the second half. But I just thought it was a, a nice, complete team game. Um, most everyone contributed in some way, shape, or form. And again, I know Helms. Had a, had a pretty brutal shooting night, but he was guarding Garrison Brooks on the block. Like, that's not easy necessarily, or having to guard Baycott or any of those other monsters that come into the front line with UNC. So, like, that's tough. It, that, that's like a big ask for a guy that's more of like a wing in, in Hellums, sort of playing that Torin Doran role. And, uh, and I thought he made just enough plays um, when UNC started trapping uh, to get the ball to the second side of the court and then to get the ball to the rim for, for Bates to finish. And uh, so, yeah, I thought, I thought everyone sort of contributed in some way, shape or form. And there's, there's probably a lot to unpack, although you guys probably touched on some of it uh, in the, the post game pod last or the other night. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought up Helms cause you know, I know he was taking some heat on social media and on, on the message boards assuredly, but you know, sometimes it's just, sometimes the baskets, you know, just aren't dropping. Uh, yeah. Clearly, he knew. Every, everybody in the stadium knew that it just wasn't his shooting night. But a very good point that he was guarding Garrison Brooks, the preseason ACC Player of the Year. And, you know, if it continues the type of usage that he's going to have with the loaded front court, I doubt that he's going to become the ACC Player of the Year. No, he's Nonetheless, not. <laughs> he was a, he's a highly regarded veteran ACC player, a mm-hmm. player that, you know, tore up NC State last year in two games last year. I think he averaged 27 and a half points and 10 rebounds per game mm-hmm. in the two contests against the Wolfpack. And, you know, NC State was so limited with their bigs. I mean, they enter that contest with one player, Manny Bates, over six foot yeah. 10. Carolina has six of them. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> they've got enough to put an entire lineup of six foot 10 or plus guys. Wouldn't want to see the ball handling on that. But, no, probably not. <laughs> but regardless, NC State was very, very thin in terms of usage, bigs that were usable in the post to guard some of that front court. And Jericho Helms came up big, particularly in the second half on the defensive end. And as you said, he had some great dishes to Manny Bates. So, you know, I think we should go a little easy on the guy. The shots will drop. We know he's a capable scorer. Um, he's just got to find that rhythm again. And uh I'm I'm curious to know kind of what where where you see him going from here because when the shots drop for him he is probably one of the best scoring threats on the Cincy State team. Yeah, and and I would say too just the threat. So obviously, um, you know he he it was a really tough shooting night last night. And look, like you know as far as like pick and pop guys go, it's not like you know Jericho Helms is is Kevin Love or whatever, but he he can hit in the mid 30s on threes, you know. And that's enough of a threat that teams at least have to sort of like respond to that and realize that he has a little bit of gravity out to the three point line. And he can also put it on the deck a little bit. If you close out hard, he can, you know, dribble two or three times and get to his pull-up game. But I think one of the, one of the reasons why state had so much success early in the game, just outside of like Devin Daniels making plays and and Manny Bates being a, a force at the rim on both ends of the court was they used Jericho Helms, frequently in ball screens in the half court with Garrison Brooks on him. So this is where, you know, the advantage for when UNC has the balls for Garrison Brooks to take Helms to the block, because he's just bigger and stronger and he's got 
a little bit of post game down there. But on the flip side, State said, well, if you're going to play two of these big guys on the court, and you know UNC wants to do that, then we're going to use the guy that Garrison's guarding, and we're going to put him in a lot of pick and roll. And they did that early in the game. And so they had Daniels, uh, Hayes, Moore, any of those guys run ball screens with Jericho Helms, who would set the screen and then pop out. And, and then they would have Manny Bates in the paint, sort of like sinking and sealing and creating a little bit of leverage down there in the middle of the lane. And I thought they used that to get North South against UNC's defense. And part of that is because a it's hard for Garrison Brooks to guard. I mean, he's like, he's a semi capable space defender, but he's not like, you know, he's not great. And, um, and, and with Helms, you have to respect him out to the three point line. I just thought they used the space created by that to get into the paint and spray out from there. And I thought that was what, also forced UNC's hand to go to the to the the traps and the blitzes um, because State was sort of carving them up with some of those actions. So from Helms from here on out, like yeah, he's a spot up player for this team, but they need some spot up threats, right? That's that's the advantage of guys like Beverly and and Thomas Allen. Like they need guys that can be standstill shooters, and um, and because State has good pick and roll big guys like Bates and Funderburk. You know, Helms is a really nice compliment to that, whether you're playing him at the the three with the two big guys, or if you're playing him at that small ball four position that has become that sort of hybrid four position that, you know, Torn Dorn really manned exceptionally well for two seasons right under key to the start. And, you know, they're trying to work Helms into it and up and down maybe the last couple of years, but he's certainly a talented offensive player, just had a horrible shooting night <laughs> against UNC. Look, going into this game, you know, there was so much conversation on NC State's lack of bigs and whether or not DJ Funderburk was going to play. He ended up not being able to play last night. Him and Cam Hayes and EB Duana, another big that NC State, you know, potentially could have used last night against a team like Carolina, were all game time decisions. Cam Hayes was the only one to play. Um, but, you know, to your point about NC State using the mismatches, you know, as a double edged sword against Carolina, I mean, as the Got Man once said, you got to guard us too, pal. So, uh, you know, I mean, Carolina State, you know, credit to credit to State for taking advantage of some of the, you know, lack mm -hmm. of movement from those bigs. I mean, there's Keats hasn't been afraid to go small ball at times. I mean, you saw yeah. it even in the Campbell game, there was at one point uh, in the second half of the Campbell game where Manny Bates was in foul trouble, a game that, you know, after the St. Louis game, he did a great job staying on the floor, avoiding foul trouble. Mm -hmm. struggled against the Camels. Um, yeah. But there was one point where he had four guards in Jericho Helms mm -hmm. at the five, and that was a qu pretty interesting lineup. Do you think that, you know, that's something that you could see from NC State in ACC play, or is that something that, you know, you can get away with against a team like Campbell, but maybe not against some bigger teams like, you know, the Carolinas of the world? Yeah, it probably depends on the matchups, right? And there's so many um... – you know, there's so many ACC teams that have great big guys and great front courts. Like, it'd be tough to do that against UNC or Florida State or, or Duke because they can just throw the ball down into Matt Hurt and let him go to work. But, you know, maybe against um, – if you think he can hang with Amir Sims in the post or whatever, like maybe you can try that against Clemson. Um, I'm trying to think of some other sort of like more obvious small ball teams. I think that's going to be a matchup thing and sort of like great – break glass in case of emergency I'm guessing though if you're looking at those 40 minutes of center that Keats is going to want if not all like if not all of those then the vast majority of those minutes those 40 minutes a game to have Bates or Funderburg if not both of them at the same time on the court but it, I do think it is important to remember it's like before last season um, with like Bates sort of coming on as a good defensive player and Funderburk just being so important for state last year. And, you know, the, Hellum's also missing time because of injuries. Pat Andre, you know, really struggled with, with his shot and because of injuries. That's unfortunate. Pat Andre last season is sort of like a big, you know, what if, if he could have been right, like how much could he have helped that team? But the, the point I'm trying to make here is state usually under Keats plays four round one and they play one big guy, but because the last two seasons, Funderburk and Bates have been two of their five best players. You know, he's gone. And because DJ can also sort of like slide out and guard guard fours and switch because they switch one through four and DJ has the ability to, to guard several positions like they can get away with it. 
um, it pinches them a little bit offensively. But I think it'll be interesting to see, you know, what next season could possibly look like. You know, if State tries to mix in more of the twin big lineups or if that sort of goes when, um, you know, DJ moves on uh, to the professional ranks. So, but yeah, I, I do think to your, to, to sorry, to circle back, like, I wouldn't expect to see that lineup that much, but I like that they're willing to try it. And it, it lets you know that it's at least, you know, something in their back pocket that they could pull out. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I wouldn't expect the, the Hellums at five lineups all too often um, going forward here. Well, I think we touched on, you know, the Carolina game enough. I mean, you gotta keep in mind, everybody wants to talk about the Carolina game more because it, there's such a stigma around it. It's a rivalry, and there's there's that element of, you know, Carolina, since Roy Williams has been in Chapel Hill, has just been so consistent in PNC Arena. That's just the yeah. third time since Roy Williams has become the head coach at UNC that NC State defeated uh, the Tar Heels in PNC Arena, and only the second time an unranked NC State team beat a ranked Carolina team the only the third time NC State was a heavy favorite back in 2013 when the season where NC State was like a preseason number six State mm -hmm. was a ranked team Carolina was unranked but um yeah I mean Roy's just had so much success in that building but it was really interesting element I was one of like 250 people in there and you know to me I almost thought no fans in that stadium was was almost kind of to the benefit of NC State because and Keith's kind of alluded to this after the game. I mean, not that, you know, 19,000 fans cheering for you isn't going to help you at times. Um, but the way NC State plays, they're, kind of, they're already a team that brings their own energy. Mm -hmm. I mean, fans could help, but they, they're a full-court press team. Um, you can't come into that game. You, you can't come into their uh, game plans without energy. So in an empty environment where, you know, there's only – it's, it's kind of like an AAU type of crowd, if you will. Um, <laughs> you know, there was no pressure. Like, mm -hmm. like every, every time Roy adds another one in PNC Arena, it seems like the tension just continuously rises and rises in PNC Arena. And then mm -hmm. if the shots don't drop early, then the players can almost sense that nervous energy, if you will, in the building. Yeah. And, I, it, you know, imagine what the feeling in the building would have been when Carolina finishes the first half on that 9-0 run, I mean, NC State had an opportunity to, <laughs> to be up 20 points easily at halftime. And then Bates yeah. picks up that second foul, and as you mentioned, that changed everything. I mean, Carolina was just able to play bully ball in the post. Um, but, I mean, the, the feeling in the building would have been incredibly nervous. Had, you know, Carolina <laughs> going into the locker room, cutting the lead down to seven or eight points. And, you know, they do that Carolina thing where they just bang, boom, bam, you know, mm -hmm. throw up some points in the last minute, then they just sprint off into the locker room. It, mm -hmm. it seems like that's a characteristic Carolina thing specifically. And I think everyone that's followed NC State basketball fought at halftime. We we know how this one's gonna end. <laughs> Here we go. Right? Again. Yeah. But it was up to this. It was I'm I mean, I'm not trying to pat my own back here, but I was pretty dang accurate with my game prediction going into this game. I picked NC State 79-75. I was one point off. And I said State has to jump out to an early lead and they got to stay composed in the second half and they got to get big shots from their senior guards to win this game. And, you know, Beverly didn't necessarily splash the big threes down the stretch like I thought, you know. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, Daniels and Beverly could have put that game away a little bit earlier than, than it was yeah. because they missed some free throws down in the last couple minutes. But there was one point with uh, about over eight minutes to go where Carolina – shrunk the lead to one. It was the last time they shrunk the lead to one in that game. And then Daniel scored eight consecutive points yeah. for NC state. He just, he kind of took over. It's like, give the ball to him. He's going to, he's going to make something out of nothing. And he just has a knack for getting into the lane and making these ugly finishes where, you know, yeah. look, two points is two points. It doesn't have to be a, a beautiful dunk. It doesn't have to be some finesse finish. I mean, Daniel's just kind of has that little floater that he just shoots up there and then, somehow drop. So let's talk about him. I mean, mm -hmm. wh what type of, what type of confidence is a guy like that going to get from a game like that? And it seems to me like at least through these first six games, he's a type of guy that's really stepping up as a, as a senior leader, a guy that NC state can mm -hmm. go to on a consistent basis, particularly late in games and trust that he's going to be able to get you a bucket when you need one. Yeah. He's fearless, man. He has it. His confidence is off the charts. He had a nice, I thought his first season in 1819, 
you know, a little up and down had shot selection wasn't great. And I thought last year he really re last season, he really focused on getting all the way to the rim. And yeah, he's got some quirky finishes. He uses, he comes off the wrong foot at times. He uses weird angles, but he is so hell bent on getting to the rim and getting to the paint. And, and we know what he can do on the defensive end. He has good size on the wing. He's a good point of attack defender. He was their best point of attack defender last season, but now they have guys like, you know, they got Shaq Moore and Thomas Allen that can do some of that stuff um, as well. But he's shooting 61% on twos this year, shooting 73% at the rim. And uh, he's at 22 makes at the rim this year. 21 of those 22 field goals at the rim for Devin Daniels have been unassisted. So like he's getting to the rim, off pick and roll, getting downhill, doing it off a live dribble. He's fourth in the ACC right now in pick and roll efficiency behind Carly Jones, Isaiah Wong, and MJ Walker. He's shooting 53% out of the pick and roll this year. A lot of that's right at the rim. And just like he is the true guy to get off a live dribble, to get all the way into the paint and get to the rim. Like Cam Hayes, I think, is going to eventually get there, but he's more of a pull-up guy right now. Shaq Moore's – I. It really like he can be very dynamic with the basketball, but Daniels is the one that you certainly trust the most. He's getting to the line more frequently this year, drawing 4.8 fouls per 40 minutes. He has five and ones on the season. That's most on the roster. Uh, DJ Funderburg is second with four. Um, so you can see like he's a magnet for usable content and con- contact, pardon me. And <laughs> I was worried. <laughs> let's hope, let's hope this is usable content. Um, Absolutely. But uh, I just, my primary concern with State this year, I thought they checked a lot of boxes with guys coming back. And I thought Daniels could ascend to this type of role, but I wasn't 100% sure because he's more of a secondary guy. Last year, they've been so heliocentric on offense with Markel. And I wondered who was going to be the half court engine for them. And like, he's very clearly like answering that bell. Um, they run a lot of those side pick and rolls where you'll see they come up in a little one four high set. And you, they'll bring Daniels across the formation. It looks like a receiver going in motion off those little Iverson screens where he'll go from left wing to right wing across screens from Bates and Helms, And they'll throw it to him on the side. And then they'll run side pick and roll with Bates or side pick and pop with Helms and let him get downhill. And he's really good at doing it. Um, so he's been sensational this year. And um, yeah, I just state ceiling is a lot higher with Daniels being like this productive of a downhill driver or downhill driver and pick and roll creator for the pack. And you can almost tell in his like post game, uh, you know, comments. And I had the privilege of interviewing him for a story I wrote in the Wolfpacker magazine, which is now online. If you want to buy that on the Wolfpacker online.com, but I did a two or three page feature on him and, you know, kind of talked about where he saw his role on the team and going into his senior season. You know, he was one of two guys like Funderburk that made us, you know, the decision to come back this year, two guys that, you know, even if they couldn't have made it into the NBA or gotten on an NBA roster, they could have gone and and made some money in Europe if they wanted to go on and and move on from college, but they decided to come back for another season and and see what could happen in Raleigh in, in 2020, 2021. And, you know, Daniels was, you know, always an important player on this roster. He was kind of more of an energy guy, though, last year. A guy that, you know, probably their best on-ball defender was typically guarding the best perimeter player on the opponent any given night. Mm-hmm. But, you know, not necessarily looked to as the go-to scorer, not necessarily looked to as the leader in the locker room. But this year you can just tell that he's kind of embraced that role, that these freshmen – really look up to him as a guy that's been around the block is, you know, an experienced college basketball player. And Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's going to be important for this team, you know, because you can have all the talent in the world, but you still kind of, you still kind of need that alpha at the top to, you know, Mm -hmm. especially with so many young guys on this team, somebody that can truly give you that experience. Cause I mean, this is the first Carolina state game for all these freshmen and almost played to their benefit because it's like yeah. you've seen time and time again from NC State players that, again, that tension continues to rise. The more and more they lose to Carolina, the more and more it's like, are we ever going to freaking beat these guys? Yeah. But Shaq Moore and Cam Hay, I mean, they were just – like they've played with these guys on AAU ball for several mm-hmm. summers, and Shaquille Moore talked about that after the game. He's like, that's nothing new. I mean, yeah. Caleb Love, RJ Davis, we've been, we know what those guys are. And mm-hmm. we wanted to prove that – 
we're just as good as them, if not better. And I thought last night they were better than them. Um, I do want to talk about, I want to talk about Shaq Moore and Cam Hayes. They're, yeah. they're just two very, they're very special freshman guards and the future is incredibly bright for this Wolfpack backcourt. Um, but they're, they're two guys that, you know, you didn't necessarily know what their roles were going to be in year one. Cam Hayes was kind of expected to come in and eventually evolve into that starting point guard role. But it seemed like in those first five or six games, or excuse me, at least four or five games, uh, last night was the six, um, that Shaquille Moore was going to be a guy that could come off the bench, give you 10 or 15 minutes a night, and give you a defensive spark. Be really mm-hmm. good in full court press, a, a steel machine, I think he might be leading NC State in steals at this point, or either him or Beverly. Beverly had four last night. Their their steal numbers are insane so far this year. Sorry to interrupt, but they, no, no, they're, they're just ridiculous how pesky they are on and off the basketball. But now, I mean, I talked about Daniels being the best defender on on the team last season. Well, he's got some competition now. Sha- yeah. Shaquille Moore, because I mean, Shaq Moore is he's not just a good defender; he is an elite defender already as a freshman and a guy that you know in year two or year three a a type of guy that could potentially contend for like a defensive player of the conference type of talent it depends Uh, if Manny Bates is still here perhaps but yeah (laughs) yeah yeah I mean there's so many defensive weapons on this team but Uh but but last night was really the coming out party for his offensive performance the shot Mm -hmm. was dropping I think he he shot two of two from the, the perimeter in the Campbell game but up to that before that game, he was like one of six um, from beyond the arc. And last night he was three of four. His first three three pointers dropped, which then, you know, made Carolina start guarding him because the first two, he was left completely wide open. It was almost mm-hmm. like on the scouting reports, like just leave it, more open. Well, I will say on one of those threes, I think it was maybe the first one he hit like a huge defensive breakdown from Caleb Love. That was why I, mean, I rewatched, I rewatched the first half of this game this morning and that is like one of those they like state ran one of those side ball screens that I was just talking about with Daniels. And when he got into the paint, Caleb love came out of like, it, it wasn't his help responsibility. Like he was in that strong side corner more ran to the weak side corner. And as opposed to letting like the other big guy sort of step up and take Daniels, Caleb love just stopped guarding more and just well, it came over and helped Daniels. And it, like, it was such an easy pitch and catch to, to Shaq Moore in the corner because Caleb Love, who has been spotty as an off-ball defender this season among his issues on offense, I mean, he was bad last night. Um, it, that, I mean, that is like a huge defensive red flag. He just completely, like, that's not in the, that was not in the game plan. Like, that was him freelancing <laughs> defensively, um, and it cost his team three points. Well, once, once, uh, I mean, this, the next play, the next NC State possession, Moore basically hits the same shot from the same place. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. Carolina played a little bit better defense on that second one. But after mm-hmm, he yes. dropped those first two, it was like, okay, we need to make sure we've got a body on this guy at the perimeter. Mm-hmm. He dropped another one. The shot was obviously going down for Moore. But then he took advantage of that defense there in the second half. I mean, the, the play of the year so far for NC <laughs> State last year, he gets a good look in the corner. Uh, with 10 minutes to go in the second half, pump fakes Garrison Brooks, dribbles around him, and then just slams it home. I mean, I think he probably got off the, the ground like 40 inches. I mean, an, an insane vertical, insane athleticism. Dunks over uh, Kessler, Walker Kessler, who's the seven foot, foot one. Foot taller than him. Yeah. I mean, it was <laughs> – if, if if that was that was where the fans were really missed because if mm-hmm. the fans were in the stadium for that, that was one that like – they would have been on their feet until the next time out. Yeah. It was, it was a, it was a jaw dropping type of dunk. So a long winded way of saying Shaquille Moore finally shows off his offensive ability, finally shows off what Keats has been saying about his potential. We've already seen the offensive potential of Cam Hayes. So just your, your impression of Moore and Hayes and just what this backcourt can be with those two guys. Yeah, I mean, I, I really liked Shaq Moore heading into this season. I actually saw a couple of his games at Moravian Prep during, like, I watched the tape during the pandemic um, because I was trying to catch, see a little Josh Hall. And so I ended up just catching Shaq Moore because of that. And I was like, who is this guy? He is a, a like, his athleticism jumps off the screen, right? Um, he's, he's, not, he's not even, like, skinny. Like, he's pretty stocky and well-built already for a freshman guard. And you see the 
the vertical pop and explosion that he has is is incredible. And you you mentioned it, like you set it up perfectly. Like he hit those two spot up threes. And then later in the game, he got that dunk in the half court because he forced a closeout and he was able to scoop by and go baseline and, and spike it on top of Kessler. But the dunk that he had in the first half was also really impressive. Um, terrible pass by RJ Davis, like nice job by, it was really good help defense by Manny Bates who crashed down on RJ Davis's drive. Davis just fling the pass back out. I think it was to Baycott, um, but it was, it was, a, it was a horrible pass. It was a really bad pass and Baycott who is a monster. Like he's one of the, the top 20, top 25 prospects for the 2021 draft. But like, he didn't exactly like hustle after the loose ball and Shaq Moore shot out of a cannon comes from the other side of the court beats Baycott, pardon me, beats sharp to the ball and then flies down the court. And like with sharp, you gotta be worried about a chase down block too, but he just, he got so far out ahead of him. It was an easy, it was an easy steal and dunk. Um, 7% steal rate this season for Shaq Moore. That means when he's on the court, 7% of NC state's defensive possessions are resulting in him steep, just taking the ball from an opponent. So you can see how, when you have guys like Shaq Moore, and Manny Bates on the court together, you've got an, you've got a, you know, steals artist and you've got an elite, truly an elite backline rim protector in, in Bates. And just like, yeah, there's, there's a certain percentage of opponent possessions on offense now in the half court where you can just write them off as they're going to be, they're going to be negative possessions, right? Because like state's going to say it's going to end in a steal or a block. Um, and that can really ignite State's uh, transition game. I know we're talking about Moore and Hayes here, but I think to your point about the, you know, not having fans in there last night and Moore's dunk being such a, you know, an excitement bringer. I think Bates's blocks do that too. Like he, those, the Manny Bates blocks, like give this team, it, they, they're like, it just, they jump up a level for, for 30 seconds after that. And frequently he does a nice job keeping the ball in play. And so they, they just, he pins them or he blocks them out and they reserve, they, they literally a uh, jumpstart transition too. But, you know, I thought bringing in more in haze, there was a chance you just not being as well in tune to the prep scene until these guys really get on campus. But my thought was like, Oh, they're just looking at multiple options to replace Markel, right? Like, one of these guys is going to win out in the long term, and then you know who knows if the other guy sticks around or whatever. And just one guy is going to turn into be the long term solution for without Markel. Those two guys have only played 38 minutes together so far this season, and that's it's a limited sample because of you know Moore wasn't really playing a lot early in the year. Cam Hayes missed time, um, and there's certainly some positional overlap too. But you can see how those guys can play together, and I think that's really encouraging for this season for sure. But really the next three or four years, two, three, four years, um, because all of a sudden those guys can, those guys looks like they both can spot up and shoot a little bit so they can play without the basketball. We've seen what Shaquille Moore can do beating closeouts and getting to the rim. We've seen what Cam Hayes can do beating a, beating a closeout and getting to his pull-up jumper. And so State could have two guys that, that get a lot of steals and can play make for them offensively, and you can play them together. Um, man, the, it, like the ideal sort of college lineup has like dual playmakers like that on the court, right? And and maybe they won't be quite ready for that for that role every night, every game this year. But going forward in the future, it's a really promising duo um, for Keats. And I mean, you look at the backcourt depth now, and you've got five guys that you can you can entrust I, at this point i think you can entrust them pretty much at any point in the game of course down the stretch keats went with his experienced veteran guys mm-hmm. in a you know a high stakes rivalry game probably the smart move cuz you never know how those freshmen are going to react late in the game they were playing early on in the halves um, when the game was a little bit more loose and then everybody kind of tightened up there in the last 5 minutes yeah um but but nc state's turned into a sneaky good perimeter shooting team you know, going into this season, we knew Beverly was going to be a great three-point shooter. We already knew that. We already knew Thomas Allen was going to bring a perimeter shooting presence. Those guys, you know, that's their strength, perimeter shooting. Mm-hmm. But then you've got, you know, Daniels who can make threes. You got Hayes and Moore who can make threes. You got Jericho Helms. I know he didn't have a good shooting night against Carolina, but he he's proven that he can make threes. Mm-hmm. I mean, just that's tough to guard. When, when a team's able to play that fast, when they're able to, to create that many turnovers, play in transition the way they want to, and then you got to worry about five different guys from the perimeter. I mean, that, it, it, 
I mean, where, where do you think NC State is standing in terms of perimeter shooting based on what you've seen around the ACC so far? They're, they're, they're pretty like well positioned. I mean, they're lower in terms of volume. Um, I think only 32% of their field goal attempts this year have been threes. So that's, that's not like crazy volume. Um, but they've made just under 40% of those shots. And yeah, I mean, like Beverly is sort of the unsung hero of this team. I actually think he's been a little bit better on the basketball than I, than I sort of thought he would be this year. It's, it's great to see him healthy. Like it is because, um, he's like, he's a really good shooter. I don't know if you want to quite give him like the elite label, but Braxton Beverly is a very good shooter over his entire career. Like there, he's a proven track record, good shooter. Um, same with Thomas Allen, albeit not, not nearly the same volume, but if you're going to have guys like Devin Daniels using the ball, you know, driving it, kicking out, spraying out, you need guys that can stand still and make jump shots. And that's what Helms and Allen and, and Beverly give you. Uh, I think Beverly hit two threes last night. One of them was just a pretty deep open spot up three. The other one was a, a pick and roll where I think sharp in the second half botched the, the coverage, but yeah, like they've got guys that can take and make shots off the dribble. Cam Hayes hit two big time late clock shots for them, including a pull up three in the first half um, when state still sort of had things rocking and rolling. Um it's huge. They got guys that can shoot off the dribble and they've got a couple spot up threats. I wouldn't say they're like, they're as deep shooting the basketball as say a team like Virginia tech, right? That with Mike young, you know, every game over 40% of their attempts are going to be threes. And they've got guys like Naheem Aline, uh, Hunter Couture, Jalen Cohn. Like these are like elite shooters. Jalen Cohn's an incredible movement shooter. Um, so, you know, they're not going to, they, they're not going to like chuck threes like that, but one of the places where the math can help NC State a little bit is that, you know, I just said that about 32% of State's field goal attempts are threes. Well, I think it's important really to start paying it a little bit of attention to State's defense and what they're doing outside of the turnovers. Because this is a team that right now, depending on what site you're looking at, is either top 25 or top 35 in adjusted defensive efficiency. And one of those reasons is because this year opponents um, – less than 26% of the field goal attempts against NC state's defense this year have been three pointers. So in terms of three point attempt rate, 25.9%, um, that's huge for state on the margins, right? Like it, like historically under Keats state has been very good about running teams off the three point line. Now, perhaps that led to a lot of like layups at the rim, but now you got Manny Bates down there waiting to block 15% of those shots. Right. Right. Um, and so it's, it is a huge map. That's, that's top five nationally, by the way, that 25.9% number that's top five nationally an opponent three point uh, attempt rate. And so even if States only shooting in the low in terms of their own volume is shooting like in the low thirties, like they're still winning on the margins because they're probably going to get up more threes. No, that's not going to be the case when they play like Virginia tech or whatever but they're doing a good job running teams off the three point line, which they always have done under Keats. Um, it's just through this small sample to, to launch the year, they're doing a little bit better job and that's big for you um, on the margins. And, and just to add to that point quickly, I mean, the, you know, Keats didn't need this NC state team to be the best three point shooting team in the conference mm -hmm. or a top three right now. I mean, before I checked uh, before the Carolina game last night, NC State, I believe, ranked third in the conference in terms of three-point shooting percentage. Um, that might even be better after last night, the way they shot the ball. Um, but again, you look at the past three seasons under Keats, I mean, NC State's been one of the worst teams in the league at perimeter shooting. They, especially last year, I think they shot like around 31, 32% from the perimeter. So, you know, if they can, they can keep making these shots from three, if you can even just be an average three-point shooting team with those type of you know, numbers and, and, and margins, if you will, uh, you know, the, this NC state team has a lot of potential. We've, mm -hmm. we've brought up uh, Manny Bates a few times, but I think his play over the past three games is very deserving of us to spend some time talking about him yeah. in a segment. Um, you know, clearly he's been an important player, probably the most valuable player on the court when you consider the absence of DJ Funderburk over these past three games. Mm -hmm. Um but what you've seen from him is his offensive confidence to shoot through the roof. Starting with the St. Louis game, um, he was the leading scorer in that game. I think he's been in double figures in every game since the St. Louis game. Hasn't dropped, 
you know, any of his blocking numbers, he's still blocking the same amount of shots. I think he had eight blocks against St. Louis, six last <laughs> night against Carolina. I mean, he's just a he's the fastest guy to reach a hundred blocks in NC State program history. I mean, we're talking about a guy that, you know, if he sticks around for four years, like we're talking about a guy that could potentially, you know, contend for setting an ACC record in mm-hmm. terms of block shots. Like he's on pace to be a top five all time ACC shot blocker if he stays a full four years, which if he keeps playing this way is not, uh, yeah. is not an entire <laughs> certainty. So, yeah. um, but just w- how much does a Manny Bates that you can not only entrust on the defensive end, but you can also entrust on the offensive end and a Manny Bates that can stay on the floor for over 30 minutes a game. What, how, what, what element does that bring to this NC state team? How much better does it make them? It's huge. He's such a floor setter for them, right? Like, like if you're playing, if this guy's on the court, you can be, but only so bad defensively, right? Like there's just going to be a certain standard because he's going to block X number of, of shots per game, six per 40 minutes, basically like maybe a little bit more than that. Um, that's huge. That, that means six high percentage shots are just getting wiped away every game. So he's just, he's setting your floor for you defensively. Um, and he makes everything more difficult for an opponent offense because of that. I think he's a guy that you've got to sort of like game plan a little bit around. Uh, if you can't get him in foul trouble. And then once you do just think about what state's defense, how it changes, you know, when Manny Bates is, um, is off the court and yeah, uh, Manny Bates now he's played 149 minutes this season, NC state's plus 74. So they've outscored opponents by 74 points um, with Bates on the court this season. That includes, he was a game high plus 11 versus UNC. Um, and in the St. Louis game, in the UNC game, in the seven total minutes with Bates off the court, NC State outscored by nine points um, in that segment, basically because they couldn't score and opponents started scoring much more frequently. Uh, with Bates on the court this season, NC State um, scoring 120 points per 100 possessions and the defense is allowing 91 points per 100 possessions. That's a net rating of 29 points per 100 possessions. Like these are all small samples, but like those are awesome numbers. Just to like, I won't provide any more context other than that. Just to let you know, like those are great numbers and the sign of like a really effective two-way player. Um, and we were just talking about State's three-point shooting. Uh, like Manny Bates plays a role in that as well. Like he's never going to shoot a three. But his presence setting screens and rolling to the lane, like having a guy that has vertical gravity that can roll down the middle of a defense, that can compress defenses, that can force help, that can also create those open slash and kick threes to the sort of like, you know, army of wings that state's going to deploy around him. Um, You know, Kevin Keats wants to play spread pick and roll. Well, he's got like an elite pick and roll center offensively, maybe not elite pick and roll center, but like a very promising pick and roll center on the offensive end. And then defensively um, they switch one through four and let and run teams off the line and bait clean Bates tries to clean up every mess at the rim. And he's pretty damn good at doing it. So I've got one more topic we need to touch on before I give a parting shot that I'm sure NC state fans will be slobbering at the mouth to, uh, to, to hear. Um, but let's talk about the turnovers. I mean, we know Kevin Keats is a guy that, you know, his, the identity of his teams is we want to press, we want to create turnovers, we want to run and transition, get points in transition. But when they're playing this elite in terms of creating turnovers, I mean, I, I think I checked Ken Palm this morning, their turnover percentage ranks second nationally among mm-hmm. 300 plus division one teams. Their steal rate is top five nationally. Mm-hmm. I mean, just can you put into perspective how – high of a level NC state is playing in terms of creating turnovers and forcing steals on the defensive end. Yeah. And look, part of it is like, it's, it is, you know, last time we recorded, we tried to couch everything in terms of small sample. And like, that still sort of applies. Like they've played six games um, and two of them have been against like, you know, real good teams like St. Louis and UNC. Those are very good basketball. Those are top 20, top 20, top 25, top 30 teams, you know, in the country. And Carolina does turn the ball over a lot. They Dis- do. Disclaimer. They they do. Well, like um, it is, it is a blessing and a curse to have guys like Caleb Love and R.J. Davis as your, like your key decision makers, right? Because those guys are really talented. Um, despite Caleb Love's struggles this year, 
he is very talented. One day he'll you know, be a point guard in the NBA. It's just going to take a lot of work to get there, more so than probably we thought before the year started. But they, I mean, it, like it helps your turnover rate when those guys throw just awful passes. And they did. Like some of their p- passes at the start of possessions last night were just, uh, were just terrible. Um, but NC State's putting, can force you into that because they put a lot of pressure on the basketball at the point of attack. That's where Shaq Moore comes in. Um, and where he really has the chance to grow as like an impactful defender for state is that even on possessions where like he's not just taking the ball away from the opponent that he's guarding one-on-one you put ball pressure like that on someone you make them see that for 90 feet and then it continues into the half court that's what forces the bad passes right and then you have to have opportunistic wings and state has the state has guys that like to gamble that they have guys that like to be athletic and get into passing lanes cam hayes Devin Daniels, um, Shaq Moore, uh, Thomas Allen, uh, even Braxton Beverly. Hell, I mean, he's not maybe not quite as, as long as some of these other guys, but like State has so many guys on this roster now. Yeah, Devin Daniels, 3% steal rate. Cam Hayes, 4.7% steal rate. Shaq Moore, 7.3%. Darion Sebron, uh, 2.6% steal rate. Beverly, 4.1%. Thomas Allen, 3.1%. Like these are crazy numbers. And I do think, too, you can tie Bates back into this as well, which is that, like, I'm not in the locker room, so, like, I don't know if this is the case, but perhaps this is something you could ask these guys. Like, do they feel more emboldened to to gamble and to jump into passing lanes, not just because they're being coached up and told to do that, but because they know Manny Bates (laughs) is waiting behind them. It's like, if you make a mistake, you've got Bates behind you to just erase it. And does that, does that give you a look, are you able to gamble a little bit more? And if you're able to be two inches more tightly into the passing lane, does that give you, you know, X percent chance better of, of getting a deflection and then getting a steal? Like, I don't know. Some of that stuff's tough to tough to measure at this point, but I certainly don't think it hurts to know that you have that guy waiting behind you and, and you can be uber aggressive. And, and certainly like they've been given the green light to play this style of basketball and, we'll just see if it continues once they start going up against better guards. Like it's going to become more of a challenge once they get into the ACC, um, obviously, but still nothing to sneeze at being top five nationally in both turnover rate and, and, uh, and steal rate. You know, that's a great thought, Brian. That's a great idea for a question. I am totally going to steal that and use that in the coming weeks. So I will keep you posted. Yeah, I'll keep you posted. We'll talk about it on the next hoops talk podcast here. Um, and I'll, I'll get back to you on that one, Brian. But Perfect. last thing here, um, you know, we talked about the turnovers. We've talked about, you know, the front court, back court, if you will. But I think the, one of the craziest things about last night, everybody gets excited about a win over Carolina, a ranked team, NC State's first ranked win of the season over its, in its first game against a ranked opponent this season. But probably its best performance so far through six games. And that comes with – a roster that wasn't even at full strength. You know, DJ Funderburg, one of your best players was not available. Cam Hayes, one of your best players was available and NC state definitely got some help in those 11 minutes that he played against Carolina, but he's still, you know, getting eased back into Mm -hmm. gameplay after not playing for nearly three weeks. Um, You know, he's a guy that's probably going to see his minutes rise to about 20, 25 minutes a night. Uh, You know, EB Dewana, a guy that, you know, is not going to play a lot, but he's going to add some depth in the front court. And if a Bates or Funderburg gets into foul trouble, he could be a guy that, you know, NC State can use for defensive utility when when those guys need to take a couple minutes on the bench. Um, And Helms, you know, he didn't have a, a great offensive night, but that that's more of an outlier than a norm. So all of those factors combined, you know, where where do you see this NC State team ceiling? after last night because if you you factor in all those all those things and you add all those guys to the equation you get a better performance out of helms you add funderburk into the mix cam hayes gets more adjusted i mean just how good do you think this team can be particularly when you consider how the acc's kind of a rat race this year there's not one team that's just going to dominate everybody I mean, where, where do you think they can stack up in the league now that you've seen them against some some relevant competition? Yeah, great points all around. And in you you obviously everyone listening to this knows just how much like having Thunderbird back will shore up, shore up the front line. Like they've been so reliant on Bates in the games without him. Uh, Manny Bates has just three games in his career 
of playing 30 or more minutes um, in every single one of those games, DJ Funderburk has not played. That includes the, the, the season opener against Georgia Tech last season. And it's also him playing 36 and 37 minutes against uh, SLU and, and UNC uh, respectively. And we saw just how bad I mentioned how bad they were um, in those minutes with Bates off the court. So having Funderburk back will be huge. I think going forward, like what's the ceiling, as you said, like the ACC, like it's a little up and down. Like if you can beat UNC, you can probably beat just about anybody in the conference. I mean, Florida States, everyone, everyone brings different challenges. Um, Duke looked great against Notre Dame. Um, FSU is really good, but they, they lost to central Florida. Um, I think eventually Virginia is going to get it into gear and, and we'll see how they play against Gonzaga the day after Christmas. But I think state and, and look, I was like sort of in like the thinking state was eight or nine in the ACC this year, like sort of middle of the pack, but with the chance to go up, I was just worried about replacing Markel. But um, yeah, I think they have the chance to, if, if things continue to click into place, good health. Um, if the Funderburk and Bates partnership continues to evolve, if the Moore and Hayes partnership continues to evolve, they continue to shoot threes and force turnovers. Like I think they can be a top, you know, five team in the league somewhere, somewhere in that range, you know, maybe five or six. Um, but basically just like jumping a tier, you know what I mean? Like as opposed to going from, the middle of the pack, maybe they can get up, they can jump up to that, uh, you know, the third tier of the league or something, you know, the second or third tier of the, of the ACC. Um, we'll see. Uh, the, the, a lot depends on the health of Bates, making sure that he's still good to go because um, you know, they're, they're so dependent on him defensively and just to see how these parts continue to fit in or, you know, around, around one another. Um, but they have some stuff that you know you can trust, like Daniels and, and Bates, Beverly. Like, that stuff's good to go. Like, it's proven. Um, and if Hayes and Moore continue to come on as playmakers for them offensively, then I think they have the ability to raise their ceiling and, yeah, jump a tier in the ACC and maybe get to that, you know, five, six, seven, you know, mark. Um, I, we'll, we shall see. But, yeah, they look pretty awesome so far to start the season. It's been fun. Well, it's no doubt been a fun team to watch and a lot a, a lot of things to look forward to if you're an NC State fan. So I think that should uh, give Wolfpack fans a, a full uh, belly of NC State content over the holidays here before we get some more ACC action starting December 30th. NC State's next scheduled game is at home against Boston College, probably one of the worst teams in the ACC. So mm -hmm. uh, and, they're better, know, and they're better than they were last year too, right? Like, like Boston College isn't that good, but like they, they added some pieces to the lineup this year. Steph Mitchell's a good player. So that they're, 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 I don't think they're like an easy out, but certainly State will be, will be clearly favored in that game, obviously. It, it seems like to me that this year, particularly like the ACC's ceiling may have lowered. Like we'll still, um, Virginia at the end of the season could arise as a top 10 team. Right now, I don't think they're there yet nationally, but you've got like five teams ranked you know, 10 to 25. And then you got another group of four or five teams that could, you know, appear in the top 25 at one point in, in the year. I mean, it seems like the floor has risen and the ceiling has lowered and it's just going to be, Agreed. you know, every night in the ACC is going to be a, t a, a tough game. I know we say that every year, but this year, even more so like uh, even a team like Boston college, who I think only has two wins after yesterday. And I, I don't know if they've beaten a, a relevant team yet, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what uh, what the, challenges Boston College can present NC State on December 30th. Their, their schedule has been really tough. I mean, they, they lost to Villanova by nine. They beat Rhode Island, so there's your top, you know, 100 win. Yeah. Lost to St. John's, lost to Florida, overtime loss to Minnesota. The only really bad game they've had was that Syracuse beat them by a million points uh, <laughs> last week. But uh, Syracuse, Syracuse is pretty good this year too. So uh, you're right. It's pretty ugly, but that's got to be like a top – in terms of strength of schedule, I'd imagine that's like got to be a top 15 or, or 20 schedule. because They've played a lot, of good, a lot of good teams so far this year. All right. Well, we've taken enough of Brian's time. We're going to let him get back to his cave so he can, you know, uh, soak in all of the NBA basketball that's starting now. I mean, poor Brian, he's, he's going to be, he's going to be locked up in his apartment. What? I mean, yep. his eyes, you're going to need an eye check after a couple months. Cause wow. I mean, all these college basketball and NBA games, I mean, you're probably, you're probably thinking, where was this, uh, you know, back in April <laughs> Yeah. when we're literally yeah. like begging to watch you know, cornhole on ESPN. Yeah. <laughs> now, now there's like, and there's too much almost, and, it, you know, 
I am. It's a good problem to have, but yeah, I am like inundated. Uh, I'm shirking most of my responsibilities right now just to watch and talk uh, about basketball, but it's uh, it's certainly, it is nice to have it, but uh, it is, uh, it's costing me a little bit of sleep and free time at the moment, but that's okay. Well, if you're listening at home, you like this podcast, obviously you'll like it because you've already listened to us for an hour here talking about state basketball. So while you're at it, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. We're on Spotify. We're on Apple Podcasts. We're on Google Play, pretty much wherever you listen to podcasts. And of course, you can always stream us on thewolfpacker.com. If you don't have any of those podcast apps, you're not a smartphone person. I mean, come on, it's 2020, get a smartphone, (laughs) but, uh, you know, while you're at it, follow us on social media. You can follow our main account at the Wolfpacker on Twitter. You can follow Brian at B guys underscore bird on Twitter. You can follow me personally at Justin H will on Twitter. Give us a like on Facebook, NC state Wolfpack on the Wolfpacker.com head over to the Wolfpacker.com and use that promo code pack 60 for a free 60 day trial on all of our premium content news and analysis. And for Brian Geisinger, this is Justin Williams, and this has been the Wolfpacker Hoops Talk Podcast.